live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. This is UConn head coach Randy Edsel. The sad part about Edsel is that today, he's remembered as a punching bag following his disastrous second run at UConn, where he had an abysmal record of 6-32, winning just 15% of the games he coached there, and where the Huskies were one of the worst teams in all of the FBS. He was also known for having the world's greatest contract negotiator of all time, as he received some of the craziest bonuses I've ever seen, including a game against Tulsa in 2018, where even though the Huskies lost 49-19, he got a $2,000 bonus because UConn scored first. Truly insane. However, he deserves a lot of credit for his first stint with the team, where he took the Huskies from the Division I AA level to the Division I-A level, guided that transition, and not only made them competitive, but guided them from an independent to a team playing in the Fiesta Bowl in roughly half a decade. That being said, his first stint with the Huskies, while clearly better than his second stint, was not perfect. Far from it, in fact. It definitely had its fair share of head-scratching moments. And I can safely say that of all the moves, this one might be the dumbest one of them all. Imagine trying to deceive your opponent so badly as to who your starting quarterback is going to be for this game that you wind up deceiving yourself in the process. Well, in 2005, that's exactly what happened prior to a Big East game against Pitt. The Huskies wanted to keep the fact that quarterback Matt Bonislawski was going to be their starter a secret from Pitt so badly that they took ridiculously extreme measures to do so, and it backfired in rather spectacular fashion, and that's putting it lightly. And this is the story behind what might just be the dumbest game plan, and I do not say that lightly, in the history of UConn football. Before I talk about the actual strategy and the game in question, we need some context to understand how UConn's season was going, because it will help us to understand why exactly Edsel wanted to make this move. This man right here is quarterback Matt Bonislawski. Of all the quarterbacks to play for UConn over their short time at the FBS level, you could make the legitimate argument that Matt Bonislawski was definitely one of them. In all seriousness, he had some big shoes to fill after their previous quarterback, Dan Orlovsky, led the Big East in passing yards the year before, and got drafted by the Detroit Lions in the fifth round of the 2005 NFL Draft. And through the first four games of the season, Bonislawski was doing a pretty good job as the replacement. It seemed like UConn, after an 8-4 season the year before, where they made it to their first bowl game and won their first ever bowl game, which came in the Motor City Bowl, was picking up right where they left off. The Huskies were playing really well with Bonislawski under center. They won their first game against Buffalo 38-0, then destroyed Liberty 59-0, and after a loss to a ranked Georgia Tech team, defeated Army 47-13. Over the first four games of the season, Bonislawski was playing at a decent level, as he was a dual threat, throwing for six touchdowns and running for three. With him as the starter, the Huskies went 3-1 in non-conference play which was what just about every UConn fan was hoping for, and they entered Big East play on a really high note. However, disaster struck during their first conference game of the season, which was a Friday night game against Syracuse. The good news for the Huskies was that they won the game, and started off conference play on the right foot, as they defeated the Orange by a final score of 26-7, and were 4-1, tying the school record since making the jump to Division 1A for the best five-game start to a season in program history. The bad news, however, was that during this game, Bonislawski got hurt. They may have won the battle, but they lost the war. Because after a poor start to the game, where Bonislawski went just two for seven, he got hurt with a broken left collarbone. The amazing part, and this is a true testament to Bonislawski's toughness, was that he got hurt on the opening drive, but continued to play in the game until the pain got past the point of no return, saying, I was kind of debating if I should say anything after the first quarter. And unfortunately, when you're a quarterback and you break your collarbone, you're going to be out for a while. The diagnosis for Bonislawski's injury was possibly the remainder of the season. At the very least, it would be a six-week injury. And with Bonislawski out of the lineup, UConn's promising season fell by the wayside, as they took a hard tumble. No longer were they having possible aspirations of winning the Big East. At this point, they were just looking to stay alive and maybe make it to a bowl game for the second straight season. The offense, which was seemingly firing on all cylinders with Bonislawski in the lineup, 
was now slumping hard, as they lost three straight games, dropping a 28-17 contest to Cincinnati, a 26-24 contest to Rutgers, and a 45-13 contest to a ranked West Virginia team. Neither redshirt freshman quarterback DJ Fernandez nor true freshman quarterback Dennis Brown were getting it done in Boneslawski's absence, as regardless of who was under center, it just wasn't the same. At this point, the Huskies were 4-4, going 0-3 since losing their starting quarterback. Rennie Edsel was debating who to start, and whether he should go with Fernandez or Brown. It seemed like a formality that they would make it to a bowl game. Now, they needed to win 2 out of 3 in order to do it. And considering the fact that their final game of the season was against a ranked Louisville team, which was not good for them since the Huskies had never played a game at the Division 1A level before against a ranked school that they kept within one possession, let alone one, they had to take care of business against the two unranked opponents left. Otherwise, their season was over, and their bowl aspirations were dead in the water. With that, we head to Heinz Field for this absolutely critical Big East matchup. It's November 12, 2005, and UConn is taking on Pitt in what is a must-win game for the Huskies, and that's putting it lightly. The stakes were high. They had to win this game for every reason that I mentioned before, and they had to find some way to snap out of this funk of theirs. But while everyone was counting out the Huskies because of their lethargic play ever since Bonislawski got hurt with that broken collarbone, Randy Edsel had an ace up his sleeve, because he had a trick play that literally no one saw coming. Pitt was debating whether DJ Fernandez or Dennis Brown was going to start for UConn. And as it turned out, the answer was neither, because the man who was starting under center for UConn on this day? None other than Matt Bonislawski and the lengths to which UConn kept this a secret were, quite frankly, absurd and laughably ridiculous. Now, it would be one thing if Bonislawski was questionable to go, but on Saturday, woke up, and on his own accord, said that he was fine and was ready to play in this game. I talked about a game like that before on my main NFL channel, where in a 1978 game against the Philadelphia Eagles, St. Louis Cardinals quarterback Jim Hart was not expected to play and not a single newspaper outlet had him starting the game. However, against all odds and by some miracle that no one saw coming, Hart came in and led the cards to the upset win and their first win of the season. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But this was not one of those games. Bonislawski knew literally that Monday that he was good enough to go. As Bonislawski flat out said after this game, I found out on Monday. The doctors told me I could play. Yet, Edsel really wanted to catch Pitt off guard. He knew that Bonislawski was starting this whole time, but kept it under wraps, to the point where he never announced anything. He had Bonislawski working with the second team, and he even left Bonislawski off of the team's depth chart. Something about that feels illegal, but whatever. Good job, Randy. You sure fooled Pitt. So you might be wondering what the reaction was on the Pitt sideline when they saw the pregame warm-ups and saw Bonislawski warming up. They were probably shocked, right? Well, they weren't even given the opportunity to be shocked. Because Edsel was so dead set on keeping this illusion going, and was so set on fooling Pitt, that he didn't even have his starting quarterback warm up. That's right. Seems like a bold strategy to not have your starting quarterback, who hadn't played in over a month, not even warm up. But that's what Edsel did. While the rest of the team was warming up in their uniforms, Bonislawski was doing nothing. He was in street clothes, just watching. I think this is the hysterical part about the whole trick that Edsel tried to pull that goes way too far. When you're trying to trick someone, you have to ask yourself what the purpose is. What is the alternative that could have been done, and would it have made a difference? Let's say that Bonislawski warms up, and Pitt receives notice that, oh crap, UConn's starting quarterback that we thought was out of the game is now playing. My retort to that is, so what? Bonislawski is out warming up at 11 a.m. The game starts at noon. You're not going to be able to come up with a game plan to stop him in an hour. You didn't watch film of him. You were preparing for either Fernandez or Brown. Your game plan is set in stone at this point. Your prep work is done. I don't care how many assistants you have. You're not crafting a game plan to figure out Bonislawski's tendencies in under an hour. And you're not having someone on your scout team simulating his style. What difference would it have made if Bonislawski warmed up versus not warming up? Either way, Pitt is fooled. At this point, 
you're only hurting yourself by being dumb enough to not have your starting quarterback warm up before the game. Seems like something I would want my quarterback to do. But hey, what do I know? I have no reason to talk. I'm not a head coach who earned a $2,000 bonus because even though my team allowed 62 points to SMU and lost, my team had a better third down conversion percentage. Yes, this was actually a thing that happened to Edsel. So just to recap where we are in this bizarre saga, we have a head coach who is so dead set on deceiving his opponent into who his starting quarterback is going to be, that not only does he not disclose this information during the week, forcing Pitt to prepare for the wrong quarterback, and not only does he send over the wrong depth chart that doesn't even include Bonislawski's name, but he goes as far as not having Bonislawski warm up, just so that it is truly a surprise until the last minute. I'll give Edsel this, as stupid and as dumb as this is, I'll give him an A-plus for creativity. Makes you wonder how much faith he has in his team if he's resorting to nonsense like this to try and gain an advantage. But whatever. The important question is this. Did it work? Things can look nonsensical, but if they work, they're not so stupid anymore. A decade before this game, when Colorado head coach Rick Neuheisel took his team on a ski trip before the Cotton Bowl, that seemed idiotic and brain dead because you can just imagine all the bad things injury-wise that can happen to football players on a ski trip. But they won the game against Oregon by a ton, so it clearly worked and wasn't so stupid in hindsight. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. As long as Edsel's strategy worked, hey, more power to him. Well, it did not. Not even close. Because this game was an absolute disaster, and that's putting it mildly. UConn laid an egg as the team's first trip to Pitt was one that they would love to forget. Because on this sunny mid-November day, the Huskies lost 24-0. That's right, they didn't just lay an egg, they laid a goose egg. They got shut out. It was the team's second time getting shut out since making the jump to Division 1A, and was the team's first time getting shut out since November 18, 2000, when they lost 29-0 to Ball State in the regular season finale. While there were definitely some flashes, and while there were drives where they were able to move the ball down the field before failing to capitalize, as they had a few drives still in the red zone, there's not much of anything positive that you can honestly say after a game where you finish with zero points. As for Matt Bonislawski, how would he play in his first game back? Even though Pitt didn't know he was playing, and even though, at the coach's discretion to try and gain a competitive advantage in the most bizarre way possible, he didn't warm up. Well, he did not play well. I know, shocker, right? He finished the game going 18 for 35, completing just 51.4% of his passes, throwing for only 156 yards, and throwing no touchdowns and three interceptions. In fairness to him, all three picks came in the fourth quarter, when UConn was down by three possessions, and he was maybe trying to make a little too much happen. However, he did not play well. Again, there is no positive way to spin those numbers. Credit to him for making the quick recovery off of the broken collarbone, and throughout all of this, you can't deny how tough Bonislawski was, and how resilient he was, but this was not his finest hour. When he put his stats into an NFL passer rating calculator, since college passer rating is very weird, it comes out to a passer rating of just 27.8, which is worse than if he did nothing, but spiked the ball into the ground on every single play. UConn lost this game, and lost all chances of becoming bowl eligible, as they finished the season 5-6, and six, posting their first losing record since they were an independent back in 2001. And Pitt head coach Dave Wanstead said after the game on UConn's strategy, they changed up the quarterback on us. He didn't warm up. He had a sweat saw on the whole warm up. You know, he was just thinking on the inside, come on, you didn't really think that was going to work, did you? Playing trickeration and mind games can be rewarding, but you have to know how to do it. And it's safe to say that on this day in 2005, UConn head coach Randy Edsel did not whatsoever know how to do that. Because if you're going to such extreme lengths to the point where you're not announcing all week that your starting quarterback is going to be starting, you send over the wrong depth chart that doesn't even include your starting quarterback's name, and you don't even warm him up to sell it all the way until kickoff, you better not embarrass yourself to the point where you literally get shut out. UConn tried playing the long con, and the key word in that statement is try, because it's safe to say that they failed miserably. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. 
So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.